very much, Doug, and uh, thanks to all of you for the very generous and flattering invitation to be with you tonight. Uh, as was just said, I was very, very much looking forward to being with you in person. And as was just said, um, despite the fact that I work at a different institution of higher learning in Israel, uh, my family's relationship with Ben-Gurion uh, goes way back. It's true that my parents had a very, very, my parents have both passed away, unfortunately, but my parents had a really lovely relationship with Rivka Karmi. But I, I'll just say that Rivka was a bat bait in many ways. She she was always in the house. I, I remember growing up in high school and Rivka was there. It was just, oh, hi, Rivka. I mean, she was really a very, very close friend uh, during some of the time that she had reason to be in Baltimore for a whole array of reasons. And um feel very blessed that she and I have been able to continue our friendship and our being in contact over the years since we made Aliyah and subsequent to her being university president. And my dad was also very involved with the Goldman family uh, and some of the exceptionally important work that they have done and funded at Ben-Gurion, but not only for Ben-Gurion, but for the state of Israel and the world at large. And I know that my dad took extraordinary pleasure and pride in being associated with the Goldman family and with Ben-Gurion. And so while these are unspeakably dark times, um, it is still warming, even in the middle of the night here, to have an opportunity to be with the communities uh, that um, Rivka Ben Karmi, as president in her time, and the Goldman family to this very day, uh, are so central in, in perpetuating. Uh, as I said a second ago, these are, uh, these are dark times. And I think you saw it at the very, very end of Professor Shamowitz's presentation. All of us find ourselves overwhelmed by emotion in ways that um, very hard to express, it's very hard to control, and it's very hard to predict. Um, we have, as was said, a son-in-law and a son called up, um, one of them in a particularly precarious place right now. And it's hard to breathe. It's hard to do anything other than think about him. And you feel guilty sitting down for dinner, going to the porch and reading a book. Uh, you feel guilty doing anything that doesn't involve thinking about him. But of course, he and hundreds of thousands of young people are out there now precisely so we can eat dinner and read a book. Uh, but these are going to be very dark times for um, a very long time. I was on the phone yesterday with somebody who was giving me a briefing that they're obviously allowed to give me, um, nothing that was inappropriate. But my wife was overhearing it. And um, what, what became clear was that, at least according to this person, it's quite possible that the ground offensive may not happen right away. And it's quite possible that the ground offensive might not happen. And it's quite possible that the ground offensive might happen or not happen, but that Hamas is really not going to be entirely destroyed. And the likelihood of us getting all the hostages back, because they include generals and they include soldiers and they include policemen, the, the likelihood of that is, is not good. And my wife was overhearing this conversation just really about, I don't know, seven or eight hours ago here in our living room, right in the other room next to me. And she said, so we got beat. I said, maybe. Yeah, maybe we got beat. And um, don't even know what that means exactly. So we could wake up, probably I'm up, but when the rest of Israel could wake up in a few hours to the news that we've gone in, or we could be waking up in the news in two months and still not having gone in. There are an array of reasons for that, which are far beyond the purview of our conversation tonight. But these are very unpredictable times. They are times when we are still reeling from the shock of what happened. And I'll say more about that in a minute. And if anything, it is a, uh, it is a country simply filled with dread. It is a combination of grief over what did happen and dread over what might happen. Right before I went to sleep to grab a few hours of sleep before getting up for this presentation, I spoke to friends of ours around the corner. They have five kids, boys and girls, all of them married. 
All five of the guys are in. It's not much you can really say except to pray to God that everybody comes home safely. However this plays out, enormous damage has been done to the state of Israel. I don't, even mean, I don't only mean the falling of what's called the conceptia, the falling of this illusion that we lived under, that the Air Force and intelligence could keep us safe because they couldn't, and they didn't. And I mean that not only because of the horror of what has already been lost, and there's no reason to review at this time, the, the absolute unspeakably inhuman horrors that were inflicted on the 1,400 people who died two weeks ago yesterday. Um, but the horrors of things that we're still discovering. When last night around dinner time, you get the statistic that there were 21 kids now who were left with neither parent. And one of the 21 kids who has no parent is a four-year-old in Gazan captivity. What does it mean to be a four-year-old prisoner of war without parents? What are you like when you get out? What do you, how do you function as a human being for the next 80, 90 years? There are things here that are so unspeakably broken and unspeakably shocking and unspeakably frightening even now that this is a country both unbelievably strong and people showing up to their units, not 100% of those called up, but 150% of those called up are showing up. And at the same time, a country very, very broken. And one of the things that people ask themselves is, where are we going to go from here? When? When what? I don't know what what is. But in, in two weeks, in two months, in half a year, in nine months, whenever this is over and whatever is left here, when that happens, how are we going to go forward? And what you hear people say time and time again, it's all going to depend on who takes the reins. It's all going to depend on who's in charge then. And you hear more than one person say, what we're going to need is we're going to need Ben-Gurion. We're going to need somebody with profound vision, somebody with extraordinary courage, Somebody who could speak beyond, and this was not necessarily as true of David Ben-Gurion as it needs to be of the person who comes next, but somebody who can speak across the religious and social and ethnic divides that make up Israel. But what David Ben-Gurion understood, as many of his biographers have pointed out, was that mattered for the Jewish people more than anything else was having this state. Tom Segev, who wrote one of the most important biographies of David Ben-Gurion, and it's not an exclusively positive biography, no serious scholarly biography of a person as complex as David Ben-Gurion is going to be an exclusively positive. It's a biography, not a hagiography. He calls the biography a state at any cost, because that was Ben-Gurion's attitude. We had to build this state at any cost, and we did, and we are going to have to rebuild this state at any cost. We're not going to have to fix things. We're not going to have to tweak the intelligence operation. We're not going to have to figure out what went wrong militarily. We're not going to have to figure out what do you do when the entire, certain entire echelons of the government are now composed by, of political appointees and not by professionals, so that when horror does strike, people actually just don't know what to do. We're going to have to fix that, but that's not the issue. We have to rebuild the country. We are back to 1948. We're not 600,000 people or 9 million something people. We're not a fledgling economy. We're a robust economy. There are many ways in which this is different from 1948, but the way in which it's not different is that we're going to have to rebuild this country. And one of the places that the country is going to have to get rebuilt, and you know this better than I, and you know this also because Professor Shamowitz just said so, is it the South? The South is the place that has the most space. The South is the place that was destroyed. And I feel comfortable saying with this with you, um, one of our two kids who's in, my son, is a special forces person. Um, he was in a commando unit for eight years. Um, but now he's married, 
and he's got two kids. And uh, going in now is a whole different ball game for obvious reasons. And he got out for a night, and we had him home for Friday night. And we had our son-in-law home for Friday night, too, which was kind of unbelievable because we hadn't seen him since he flew back from Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's doing a PhD at Harvard. Just finished it, actually. Um, so we had the two boys together with some other people at the Shabbat table. And I said at the Shabbat table, I actually have an idea that I think some of you kids are going to think is ridiculous. But I think that Ima and I ought to get together with, I don't know, 10, 12 of our closest couple friends. And we ought to move to one of those kibbutzim. We can keep our Jerusalem homes. Maybe one day we'll come back here. This is where our lives are. This is where our synagogues are. This is where all our friends are. We moved to Jerusalem because we love Jerusalem. But what we love doesn't really matter right now. What the country needs is what matters right now. And maybe we should all just move to Be'eri or Nachal Oz or Kfar Aza for however long and show those people that they're not alone. My son-in-law said, it's not a bad idea. And my son, the one who's in special forces, that bravado, we can get anything done, said, I would never move to Be'eri or Nachal Oz or Kfar Aza. I would never take my child anywhere near Be'eri or Nachal Oz or Kfar Aza. Not now and not ever. Because those places are never, ever going to be safe ever again. Now, I hope he's wrong. And I hope his saying that at our Shabbat table just literally over 48 hours ago, five meters from where I'm sitting at this moment, he's back in, of course. I hope he's wrong. And I hope that that statement that that part of Israel will never, ever be safe enough to bring a child to is just born out of the horrors that he is seeing and hearing and learning about and that we'll be able to prove him wrong you don't very often want to prove your adult very bright child wrong but we do in this particular case but whether he's right or mostly right or wrong or mostly wrong or partly wrong i have no idea but what we know is that he can at the end of the day be exclusively right it cannot be that that part of israel is too dangerous to bring children to it cannot be that that part of Israel is too dangerous for people like us to go live in. Because if it is, they captured that part of Israel, even if they're not here anymore. And that's unfathomable, and it's untenable. But there is going to be a tremendous amount of work to do to rebuild this country. And we are going to have to rebuild it from the ground, literally from the ground up in places where they have literally no houses to go back to anymore. And we're going to have to rebuild societies and schools and communities. And it goes far beyond. And who's going to do that? Well, everybody's going to do that. But there is one institution in the South, which has always been the major institution in the South, at least since it was created. And is, of course, unfortunately, an institution in the South that we see on the news every single day those doors to the emergency room at Soroka with reporters standing in front of them as more and more soldiers who are still falling get rushed in in helicopters and in trucks and whatever and rushed through the doors of that emergency room. It's Ben-Gurion University. Ben-Gurion University is the anchor of the part of this country that is going to have to be rebuilt the most. And Professor Shamu has said quite rightly, uh, that Ben-Gurion said that it's in the Negev that the people of Israel is going to be tested. Uh, it's in the Negev that the state of Israel was tested, and it was in the Negev that the state of Israel completely failed. Completely failed. As children hid in closets for 12 hours, as they heard their parents being murdered outside the closet, and soldiers didn't arrive, for 12 hours. The people of Israel did not fail in the Negev, though. The stories of heroism that you're hopefully coming to see and hear about and learn about, there is strength and there is power and there is belief 
There is determination and there is dedication in the Negev. And it's the university, it's Ben Gurion University that is going to have to be the place that can channel all of that, not in the years to come, but in the decades to come and in the generations to come to help what is still actually being destroyed as rockets continue to fall on that area. But rebuilding here is going to take a lot more than building Be'eri and Nachal Oz and Kfar Aza and a host of other towns, which we don't need to mention right now. Because rebuilding this place is actually going to mean rebuilding Zionism. What we understood Zionism to be died two weeks ago. The purpose of Zionism has always been to create a place in the world where this couldn't happen. The purpose of Zionism was, this is what happens in Europe. This is what happens when you're not sovereign. This is what happens when you don't control your own borders, when the security forces aren't yours, when your people can't carry weapons. So we're going to build a place, said Herzl, and Achad Ha'am, and Jabotinsky, and Ben-Gurion himself. We're going to build a place that's going to be ours and our ancestral homeland. We're going to build a place where this cannot happen. And we built the place, and this did happen. Zionism is going to have to be completely rethought. Why do we have the country? What are we actually trying to create here? What do we have to do to educate our children to make sure that the values of this country remain the values of this country? And quite frankly, what do we have to do in this country to make sure that the horror before this horror that divided this country in 2023 in ways that this country had never been divided before? And I'm not taking sides here right now. My own views are probably fairly well known, but they don't make any difference at this moment. How are we... How are we going to re-educate a generation of people to make sure we never go back to that either? And that is also going to take another Ben-Gurion. It's going to take another man who, like David Ben-Gurion of blessed memory, who is the person for whom the university you have come tonight to gather to support, who wrote thousands and thousands and thousands of pages in his diary about the idea of Zionism, who wrote thousands of articles, who gave thousands of speeches who wrote no, numerous books. David Ben-Gurion, who believed in a state at any cost and Zionism at any cost because he had a vision of what statehood could do for the Jewish people. It's not so clear anymore what statehood does for the Jewish people. And the next person who leads this country and the next people who lead this country, and it's impossible to know who that will be, need to be people like David Ben-Gurion. And I'll just say something about a few of our graduates at Shalem College who have gone on to master's degree in Hebrew and, 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 and doctoral degrees who are studying at Ben-Gurion. And in the case of two that come to mind, I can say I, I know that they were offered plum positions at Hebrew University. Hebrew University, I mean the oldest, the whatever, the grand dame of, Amer of, of Israeli universities. They were offered extraordinarily illustrious and prestigious scholarships to do their doctorates at Hebrew University. And they are both studying at Ben-Gurion. And they are both thrilled to be at Ben-Gurion. And while I love going to shul at the shul that I go to every Shabbat morning, it has the one slightly annoying dimension that I see every morning, every Shabbat morning at Shul, Andy German, uh, who was one of the really great philosophy teachers at Shalem College, where I teach, who is no longer a philosophy teacher at Shalem College because he's the chair of the philosophy department at Ben-Gurion University. Uh, you got him, we didn't get him, uh, but that's to your credit. He understood what an extraordinary opportunity being associated with Ben-Gurion is, and I'm thrilled for him. And I'm thrilled for you. You are all parties to supporting what is really an extraordinary institution and has been an extraordinary institution for many, many years. I saw it through my mom and dad. 
I saw it through many years of friendship with Rivka Karmi. I see it now with our graduates who choose of all the places that they can go, including Oxford and Cambridge and all of that, to go to Ben-Gurion. And I see it even with faculty that we at Shalem very much want to either hire or keep, that sometimes we succeed and sometimes we don't, because they decide to go to a place like Ben-Gurion. Kol HaKavod to you. All the congratulations to you for what you have built. Ben-Gurion University really stands for building in the place where there was once nothing. I had a friend, Walter Ackerman, maybe some of you know him, who moved to, to Beersheba relatively early on in the days. And he told me that people used to write him letters from the States. Ben by Walter Ackerman, the tall building, Beersheba. And he would always get the mail. <laughs> I don't think you can do that anymore. I certainly wouldn't try it. Uh, but there was a day when you could actually write to Walter Ackerman and say, Walter Ackerman, who lives in the tall building in Beersheba in Israel, and the mail would get to him. Beersheba is not like that anymore. It's grown far beyond that. Ben-Gurion University looks nothing like it, what it did even when I moved here. We moved here 25 years ago, and I immediately went down to Ben-Gurion because of my family's long association with it. It doesn't look anything now like it looked 25 years ago. Ben-Gurion University is the very symbol of growth and of belief in the future and of the belief in promise and of dedication to its students, to its faculty, to its region, and to the entire state of Israel. So for your being here tonight and doing all that you do on behalf of Ben-Gurion University, but for doing all that you do on behalf of the Negev, and for doing all that you do on behalf of the state of Israel, and for standing at our side so powerfully and so closely at these very, very difficult and frightening times, I want to thank you for everything that you have done, and thank you most importantly for everything we all know you are still going to do. God bless you, and thank you very much. Wow. Okay. That, Danny, that, that's pretty good for four in the morning. I wonder what you like in prime time. Uh, it's nine o'clock late, later than we promised, but we'd love the opportunity to give you a couple of questions if people have them for, for Dr. Daniel Gordas. Anybody? Wow. Okay. Are we sure? We got one. Oh. Michael, introduce Ra yourself. Rabbi Gordas, Mike Ozer here. I, uh, you came to San Antonio to speak to our Maimonides Society years ago, and I sat with you while you had a kosher dinner <laughs> uh, in the hotel. Thank you for that. I want to, uh, can you comment a little bit on the role of American Jewry, especially younger Jews, students, what's been happening in our country and how we go about that um, challenge at this time with everything going on, not just on campuses, but in general about how uh, connected people feel to Israel. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the invitation to San Antonio. I actually remember that Maimonides event many years ago. It was wonderful. Um, I don't remember the kosher meal, but that sounds like me. So I'm sure you're right. Um, look, what's going on in America is a whole other story. And I know it's late and I won't take your time. All I'll say is this. Uh, the Yom Kippur War, 50 years in one day prior to this war. And it's an interesting question, by the way, what this war will be called. Not so obvious, but it will say a lot about how we think about this war by what we call it eventually. Um, the Yom Kippur War was an attack on the Jewish state. This war was an attack on the Jewish people. And to see the outcry against Israel before it's really almost done anything 
and the inability of the presidents of Harvard and Penn and Columbia to say anything that is not double talk, to say anything clear about the absolute horror of slaughtering, raping, beheading, burning, and torturing Jews, unable to say anything is really an unbelievable thing, and it speaks volumes about what it's going to be like to be a Jew in America in the next generation. If you're a Jew at an American campus now, the likelihood is there are people protesting against my son and son-in-law who are just trying to make sure it doesn't happen to more kids. Who beheads a baby? Who rapes a teenager in front of her mother. Who has people wallowing in blood, having the family watch each other while one is killed? And a university president in the United States can't speak out about that? You run Harvard. You're presumably pretty smart. And you can't say anything? You're the president of Columbia University, and you can't say anything? I think young people in America are facing a very, very dark short term, at least, and maybe medium term in the future. The America that I grew up in, I grew up in the United States, I grew up in Baltimore. Um, You know, I'm in my 60s. I went to high school in the 70s. Uh, The America that I grew up in doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. It just doesn't exist. And I think it's unfortunate because I grew up in an extraordinary country and in an extraordinary society with schools that were Jewish and non-Jewish and and white and and black. And and they were really extraordinary places and it just doesn't exist. So all I'll say in answer to the question is that I, I really feel very, very sorry for the young people who are now on college campuses and even in high school campuses in America. Uh, There was a video that made its way around social media the other day of kids in a San Francisco high school, I don't know if you saw it, parading up and down the hallways, screaming, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Which means, of course, that I'll be dead. And that my granddaughter, two-month-old granddaughter that I spent all day yesterday holding, because her mother was busy comforting the older kid, because the father's not around, from Palestine, from sorry, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, means that those two babies will be dead and my grand, my, my daughter-in-law will be dead and will be dead. But what do they know about this conflict? It's just become in vogue to support a cause, which not all of it, to be sure, let's be honest about that, not all of it, but a significant part of it manifests itself in the most blood-curdling, bloodthirsty, murderous, venomous ways, and people talk without knowing what in the world they're talking about. And I'll just end by saying this. You know, in the 1930s and the 1940s, students did not protest on college campuses about what was happening to the Jews in Europe. They knew. They knew. It was out there. It was in the New York Times every day. And Deborah Lipstadt, in her book called Beyond Belief, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Americans knew what was happening. But they didn't protest on college campuses. You know why? Because they just didn't really care. But that's better than what we have now. The protests on college campuses now are in favor of the people that did the slaughtering. What's the world come to? So we face very grave challenges here, some of which I itemized and some of which I didn't. Uh, But American Jews are going to face some very, very, very serious challenges as well. And my heart goes out to young American Jews who have to face this on college campuses. And the only last sentence that I'll say about that is just like we have a tremendous amount to rebuild here in Israel. American education, American Jewish education is going to have to be rebuilt completely from the ground up Because the average American Jewish kid can't answer the question, well, if this is what it's going to be like, why should I be part of this? They can't answer that question. We're sunk. And they can't. So there's a lot of rebuilding to do on the other side of the ocean as well.